a science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they felt felt right. And I just thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. I am your host, Aaron Barker, and this week we're presenting stories about coincidences. Our first story is from Gary Bremen. It was recorded in December 2019 at Open Stage Theater in Miami, Florida. This show is part of a workshop presented in collaboration with the Tiffany & Co. Foundation. The theme that night was Oceans. Like a lot of people, I owe a lot to my parents. They um, gave me a sense of exploration. They gave me a a desire to learn, and I I got a love for the ocean from them as well. My mom was not a science person, but she supported my science-y ways. And um, she was also really, really frugal. So when I saw this ad for this kit to make crystals... I said I wanted the kit, and she said, oh, no, we'll make crystals. And she went into the cabinet up above the uh, stove and got the box of salt down and mixed it into a glass of water, and we stirred it all up till it was all dissolved, and we put it into a pie pan, and we put the pie pan out on the patio. And over the next several days, we watched as the water evaporated, and I had these giant salt crystals in there. I thought that was super cool. And I um, scooped them all up and put them in a little glass jar, which I took with me to school to show off that I made crystals at home. And I'm not sure, but I bet I could probably still find that jar of crystals in the back of my closet somewhere because I just couldn't bear to throw it out. She was very artsy. Um, So she couldn't always help with the science fair projects, but they really looked great. The honeybee project was black and yellow. The water project was complementary shades of blue and whatnot. Um, so I, I, I picked up a lot from her, and I guess it was the first time that I really saw this really important marriage between science and art and how they go together. My dad was a sailmaker, and uh, he spent a lot of time on uh, Watson Island in the middle of Biscayne Bay because that's where all the sailors were. And so I was there too. Dad was a uh, champion sailor and my brother was a champion sailor and my other brother was a champion sailor and all their friends were champion sailors and I was not. (laughs) I took the lessons, but I didn't want to. And they said, oh, your brothers didn't want to either. Go ahead, take the lessons. So I took the lessons. I used to hide behind trees so I didn't have to go sailing, and I really, really sucked at it. There was a time I could take you to uh, Watson Island and the little shed where all the prams that we learned to sail in were kept, and I could show you three individual prams with holes in the fiberglass that I personally had put there by crashing into them. Where I really wanted to be was back on shore. I wanted to be back on shore poking at the seagrass clumps that had washed in and flipping over the rocks and putting crabs and snails in little containers and things like that. And sometimes when I was doing that, walking along the shoreline, I would find some cool stuff. I would find a sea urchin test or a janthina janthina shell. Let's throw that out there. Um, And sometimes I would find seeds from far off places. And... uh, Sometimes it was like the little tiny hamburger seed that's just about that big, looks just like a little hamburger, comes from equatorial regions around the world, and come washing in here in South Florida. And Sometimes I would find the little white um, round seeds called knicker beans, but we called them burning beans. And I later learned that people in the Caribbean would call them hot rocks, and I thought it's kind of cool that kids in different places called them similar things because when you take those and you rub them on your jeans or the carpet they build up frictional heat and they hold that frictional heat which you use to burn your friends and (laughs) and that was always kind of fun and then of course the the real treasure was to find the big ones that that were um about the size and color of a large size Reese's peanut butter cup 
had that little indentation at the top called a sea heart. And I um, would learn about these things, and, and as I grew to an adult, I always kept looking for these things and kept these little treasures around. And when I became a ranger at Biscayne National Park, I started to really learn about these things. And what I learned about the, the sea heart is that it came from the Amazon and Orinoco River Valleys in South America. It was from the largest legume in the world. And the legume was like a bean or a pea, right? And so here's this Reese's peanut butter cup sized pea in a pod that is six feet long. And they fall to the forest floor. And you know what happens in rainforests, right? It rains. <laughs> and when those rivers flood up, those seeds start to float that had fallen to the forest floor. And they float down the river and they float out to the sea and they wash in in Miami and in the Carolinas, and in Scotland, and in Ireland, and England, and Portugal, and they're traveling all the way around. And there's all kinds of folklore associated with them. People would cut them crosswise and make little lockets out of them. They would cut the top off and hinge the top and make a little snuff box. People who spent time on boats would carry them with them with the idea that this thing that had traveled so far landed safely on shore. And if you carried one with you, then you too would land safely wherever you were going. And so I started carrying a sea heart with me 25 years ago. It was around this time of year, Christmas time, that I went to visit my, my family and I was sitting on the couch with dad watching television. And I pulled that sea heart out as I often do and I rolled it around in my hands. And I kept seeing him kind of making these furtive glances over to the side as I'm rolling it around. And he finally says, what are you doing over there? It's driving me crazy. <laughs> so I handed him the sea heart and I told him about it. And he's looking at it really carefully. And I'm seeing the wheels start to spin in his head. And he said that his father used to carry a sea heart. And I never knew my grandfather. He was 72 when my father was born. So I never knew the man. But suddenly had even more of a connection to these sea hearts. And so I'm standing next to dad a few years ago at the funeral home. And I had long since given up on all those ideas I learned in Catholic school about better places and heavens and things like that, but there's something about losing someone close to you that makes you hearken back to all that stuff. And I reached into my pocket and I thought maybe dad needed that sea heart for his journey. And so I left it with him. In the next days I cried a lot. Um, I ran a lot. Exercise kind of helps me get through things. Sometimes I cried and ran. And I went to the water because that's also what makes me feel better. And I had always loved a quote by Isaac Dennison, but I never really fully grasped it until this time. The cure for anything is salt water, sweat, tears, or the sea. A few days later, trying to get back into the routine of things, I was back at work and I was going to do a program. And it was a program where I usually use a, the sea heart and I reached into my pocket and it wasn't there. So I quick grabbed a different program and did a walk along the shoreline of Biscayne Bay. And it was good to be into the routine. Like I said, it was good to be outside by the water. I'm walking back from this program and we have this little low wall next to the water and I look ahead and there's something sitting on the wall and I get up to it and there's a sea heart sitting on the wall. And um, if you know much about sea hearts, they wash in on the ocean side. They're not really much found in Biscayne Bay, certainly not sitting on top of a wall. Yet there it was. And I grabbed it and put it in my pocket. And about two years later, I was in the same room standing next to mom and I felt compelled to do 
the same thing, and I gave her that C heart. And in the next days, I cried and I exercised and I went finally two days after her funeral to the water. And I sat on Fort Lauderdale Beach and I watched the sky turn from purple to pink to orange as the sun rose. And I'm sitting there amongst all this sargassum and seagrass and the things that I had always grown up around. And the rhythm of the waves washing all this stuff in. And that rhythm's interrupted by this rumbling sound coming from down the beach over here. And I look and I see this big tractor coming along with the beach sweeper behind it, scooping up all the icky stuff that you want to get off the beach, all the stuff that I find fascinating. But I got to get out of the way. So I roll over on my hip and push up onto the sand through all this sargassum and about a foot away from me is this nice round almost perfectly round opening in the mounds of seagrass and the sand is perfectly smooth and smack dab in the middle is another sea heart i'm a really lucky guy i get to work in the largest marine park in the national park system and I've done so for 30 years. Even when I'm inside, the windows look out over the very same body of water where I fell in love with the ocean so many years earlier. But even when I can't be by the ocean, I know that all I have to do is reach into my pocket and I'm instantly in touch with so many of the things that ground me. That was Gary Bremen. As a national park ranger, native South Floridian Gary has spent the past 33 years telling stories of the places and people that have shaped this nation. He has visited 254 of the 419 national parks and now recognizes how much his encounters with lightning storms, bears, drag queens, and grieving parents in these magnificent places have helped shape the person he is. He lives in an urban oasis filled with native plants in the little town of Wilton Manors with his best friend, traveling buddy, and husband, Roger, and their cats, Oliver, Elliot, and Amelia. Before we move on to our next story... As we've mentioned before on the podcast, Story Collider has online live shows nearly every week featuring brand new stories that have never been on the podcast. You can find out more about those at storycollider.org. Our next story was actually recorded at one of our online live shows. You may have noticed we're starting to add some of those into our episodes this month while still continuing to share stories that were recorded at our live events held pre-COVID. In addition to these online live shows, you can also sign up for our online storytelling workshops. We hold one each month with a limited number of participants, and we hope to start adding more class options soon. We also have a science story slam once a month where you can put your name in the hat for the opportunity to tell a story. So check it out. You can find information about all of those things at storycollider.org. What's the best way to learn a new language? Immersion. But sometimes that's not in the cards. But you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Now, I might only be one week into learning German with Babbel, but I'm so excited to start being able to speak German with my mom. With Babbel, you can learn everything you need to have real-world conversations, and all it takes is just 10 minutes a day. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college, which is bonkers. But Babbel is conversation-based learning with science-backed cognitive tools like spaced repetition and interactive lessons created by real language teachers and voiced by real native speakers. So here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash story. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash story. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash story. Rules and restrictions may apply. Our next story today is from Don Frazier. It was recorded online in Don's office in San Jose, California in April 2020. The theme of that online show was One in a Million. Um, 
so um, I don't exactly remember the first time that I remember being a twin, but I do remember the first time I he about hearing about the story of our name. Um, I was about nine years old and my, my brother was telling me the story about how at the time he was about eight years old. My sister was about five years old and my older brother really, really, really wanted a baby brother. And my sister wanted a baby sister. Um, and so my parents were like, well, all you have to do is pray, you know, um, pray for the gender and be really, really good, be really obedient. And most likely you are going to get that gender of child. So my brother would be like, you know, walking on the street, praying, talking about like he's going to clean the hedges on the lawn. He's going to clean the bathroom. My sister was talking about how she's going to clean, you know, all around the house and how she was going to give up her allowance. And they would just go back and forth and back and forth um, for for months, you know, in this era that we lovingly now know as like the prayer wars. Right. <laughs> So about nine months into this, on um, June 29th of an undisclosed year, um, pop out me and my twin brother. Now, um, the thing about us coming at the time that we did was not only did my mom know that she was having twins and didn't tell her children, but she also didn't tell her husband, my dad, that she was having twins. But she knew that she was having twins because twins run in our family, uh, along with Anne and Anthony, this Erica and Erica, Eric and Erica. Uh, so she knew that twins were in the family. Um, but, but by the time that my dad got to the hospital, he was in shock. Like there's, there's twins. And, and right away when we were presented, they put around my wrist, baby A, and they put around my brother's wrist, baby B. Uh, because true to twins, we were a little bit premature and I came out first and my brother came out second. And so my family, my parents come from Trinidad and Tobago. My mom, uh, looked down at me and my little wrist and she said, but wait, you can't name my baby, baby A or baby B, you know? <laughs> and so she was, they were, she, they were, didn't know what to do. And so she's like, this one was born at dawn. So name her Dawn. And then my dad was like, yeah, and he was born right after. So name him Dwayne, because it kind of rhymes, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's how we ended up with our names, Don and Dwayne. Um, and when my parent, I mean, and when my siblings showed up at the hospital, uh, they were, they were like, there's a boy and a girl. Like, which one, which one of us, which one of us won? Which one of us won the prayer wars? And my mom was like, you both win. And their minds were blown. They were just like, oh my God, this is amazing. A boy and a girl. And so everyone's dream come true. Um, and, and so to this day, my brother still claims that, you know, he's responsible for me and my twin brother being twins. Um, whereas I just think it's science, you know, but whatever. Um, but it wasn't until we were about like nine years old that I realized that not only did I love being a twin, it was such a special and fun and amazing experience, but I also realized that the questions that people asked me were going to be the same questions they were going to ask me for the rest of my life. Uh, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them just, I wasn't so sure. Uh, for example, good questions. Which one of you was born first? I was. I was born like by a minute and a half. So like, you know, baller status, holla, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, not so great question. Are you and your twin brother identical? <laughs> no, we're not. We're fraternal. Two eggs, two strategies to become birth at the same time. We're not identical. No, not a good question. Um, <laughs> and the complicated question, um, can you all read each other's minds? And sometimes I just didn't know how to answer this question because unlike a lot of twins, um, whereas like, you know, like the other twins that I knew in my area, like Donna and Diana, who were also in our high school, who, you know, went to the same classes. I was in general education and Dwayne was in special education um, because when we were born, I was born healthy and, and everything was fine. Whereas my twin brother, Dwayne, 
he was born with an extra chromosome on the 21st chromosome, meaning he has Down syndrome. And so this question about like reading his mind, I never really knew how to answer it or like how much detail do I need to go into or do I even really represent other twins? I don't, I don't even know. But I wanted to know, like, what was the experience like for, for other twins out there? I, I didn't know any other twins that had only one with special needs. So at around the age of 14, I, I found the Internet, founded the Internet. I didn't find the Internet, but, you know, the Internet found me. Um, <laughs> and I went on it one day um, on AOL, like, you know, dial up. And I just wanted to find other people who were like me. So I went on to the browser and I typed in. Um, I wasn't so sure what I was looking for, but I put in like twins where only one of them has Down syndrome, you know? Uh, and my first thing that popped up on my browser was this article. Uh, it was in the UK, it was from the UK. And the article said the twins that are one in a million. And I was like, the twins that are one in a million. And so I read through it and there was a, a story about this woman who had twins, um, and according to the article, they were statistically one in a million. And I had never thought about that before. So I went back to the browser and I just simply clarified my search. And I said, what are the chances of having twins where one has Down syndrome and one doesn't? And sure enough, there was my answer. About one to four births in every million was one wow. uh, that had Down syndrome or both that have Down syndrome. And I thought, well, wow, like, no wonder I've never met anybody else that's that's like me. We're like unicorns, which was amazing, but also like really crazy and kind of intriguing. And so after this process, I, I, I figured, you know, I want to I want to meet other people who are like me, like, but this is before Facebook, this is before blogs, this is before like any of that kind of stuff, support groups, anything. So I started thinking like maybe... I can narrow it down to like, you know, a, a family in the city of San Francisco, but San Francisco has like only 800,000 people, not even a million people. What was I going to do? Like knock on everyone's door and figure out if anyone was a twin? Like there was, there was no, that wasn't going to happen. I thought about the Special Olympics where Dwayne and I would spend our Saturdays. Um, but then again, it's the same, it's the same thing. Was I going to go up to every single Special Olympics athlete and ask them if they had a twin brother or a twin sister? Like my strategy, I just had to like squash it. Um, and I just real, I just figured, you know, I'm just probably never going to be able to have this opportunity, uh, until one day when I was out playing soccer with, with my dad, who was our, our soccer coach. And, um, it was going into the championship season. It was like probably the second to last game. And at our last, second to last game, I look over to the side as we're finishing up the, the, the scrimmage. And there are these two boys who are on the sidelines and, I can tell that they have Down syndrome, both of them. And they're waving to one of my colleagues on, uh, on the soccer field. And they're waving at Mary, one of the, the strikers. I was, you know, I was playing in the backfield. And I was like, Mary, who is that? And she's like, oh, those are my twin brothers. And I was like, what? You have twin brothers who have, who have Down syndrome? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, do you know that I have a twin brother who has Down syndrome? She's like, no, I was like, I would, I would love to like introduce them to him. She's like, well, yeah, like all of us are like, you know, those are my twins. I'm actually a triplet. Um, and Whoa. I was like, what? Like, uh, and like my mind was blown. I was like, and so I started asking questions. I was like, how does that happen? She's like, well, you know, we're triplets. So one egg split and that became the two of them, identical twin brothers with Down syndrome. I was that third egg who came out and the three of us are triplets. And I was like pumped because this was my first, this was going to be my first person I could ask these questions of like, you know, like, can, can you all read each other's minds? I mean, <laughs> you know, like, like, do you ever feel the need to kind of protect your, your, your siblings, your, your brothers? Like, you know, what about your parents? Which one takes care of who and what? And I had all these questions for her. Um, but the weekend king we we played our our meet and i introduced Dwayne to um mary's brothers who were martin and um marvin and uh <laughs> and unfortunately that was it because 
not too long afterwards, Mary and her brothers moved. And I never got a chance to really ask her these questions. And to this day, um, you know, 40 some odd years into life, I still haven't met another twin like myself and Dwayne. But that day when I met Mary and her, her the triplets, you know, it, it gave me a little bit more hope, a little bit more of a spark that maybe possibly one day I will. Thank you. That was Don Frazier. Don is a storyteller, public speaker, and nationally acclaimed communications coach based out of San Jose, California. She is the creator and host of Barbershop Stories, which features storytellers performing true tales in barbershops and salons around New York and the founder and CEO of Fraser's Edge LLC, which offers programs for businesses, nonprofits, and college students to have the opportunity to develop their leadership potential through storytelling. Don currently serves as a lead instructor with The Moth and was featured among some of the nation's top changemakers at TEDNYC. We're so grateful to Gary and Don for sharing their stories with us. Story Collider is also very grateful for the support of Science Sandbox, the Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. Story Collider is led by me, Artistic Director Aaron Barker, as well as Executive Director Liz Neely. We couldn't do it without help from Deputy Director Nissa Greenberg, Operations Manager Lindsay Cooper, and the rest of our amazing team. Stories featured in today's episode were from shows produced by Christine Gentry, Gastor Almonte, myself, Aaron Barker, and Nissa Greenberg. The podcast is produced by our podcast team, including Jen Chen and Gwen Hogan. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon and the online platform Crowdcast for hosting these shows, and to all of you for listening, whether you found us by coincidence or not. Thanks. Thanks.